So, hi, my name is Ryan McCain, and this is my presentation on the impact at Malvern Prep School. So, some of the objectives I'm going to go over today are why did I want to become an advanced scholarly practitioner? So, this is the term that really defines us by the end of the DAT program at the University of Idaho. I'm going to go over some philosophies that are meaningful to me, not only to me, but to the program, the sports medicine program here. Um, why outcome measures have been a major impact uh, for the program. I'm going to go over some specific data collection that I've had over the past two years, and my future goals at my clinical site here. So advanced scholarly practitioner. So this term basically uh, shows how I can expand my knowledge post-professionally. So I've developed my basic knowledge at Newman University in my undergrad, and I wanted just to expand that knowledge because I wanted to become a better athletic trainer. And this really drove me during a past internship experience at Wyoming University. I had a preceptor who showed me some new menu therapy techniques. And this really interested me, interested me a lot. And I wanted to um, go into the program, the DET program, with a focus on the clinical aspect using these paradigms and using these to help better treat um, patients in my, uh, at my clinical site. And with these manual therapy techniques, I believe this is a growing knowledge of the athletic training profession today. So a lot of our colleagues in the program are using these techniques and developing articles that are being published today and over the past few years. And, you know, I wanted to be a part of this, and this is part of the scholarly portion of this term. So disseminating that knowledge in a scholarly way. So using our research to you know, reach out to other athletic trainers about what we're doing in our clinical sites. So this is my goal um, after this program is, is over. Uh, so innovative assessment and treatment approaches. So what I'm bringing to the table now at Malvern Prep. Um, so some new philosophies, uh, global holistic approach slash patient-centered care. So treating the patient as a whole. So we know that pain in patients are not necessarily just physical. So they can be emotional, they can be spiritual as well. So I wanted to bring this uh, into my patient care. So now I can use some of my techniques that I learned in the program to address these issues. So Eden Energy Medicine and the Yoon Method. So these are able to help me address these issues. Um, regional inter interdependence is part of the global approach. So with regional interdependence, pain may be caused by somewhere else in the body that you know, may be causing that issue locally. So techniques such as primal reflex release technique or PERT address it or uses the autonomic nervous system to address musculoskeletal conditions, so somewhere else in the body. And then total motion release, TMR, these are just two examples, but TMR uses a evaluation process to look for imbalances throughout the body and treating those imba imbalances to treat that local issue. And I've had a lot of success with these two techniques throughout the past years, and I believe this has been a major impact for me and for the program. Um, as well as the positional fault theory with the Mulligan concept. So Mulligan concept, I've had a lot of success for the past two years too with a bunch of injuries, ankle sprains, and I'll be going over this a little bit more later in the presentation. So the importance of outcome measures. Um, this, this, I believe, is one of the major impacts here at Malvern Prep. Um, so using evidence-based practice, your best research evidence in the literature, with your clinical expertise and experiences. So what, what in the literature bases our decisions in our patient care? And this is um, what, what, we, what most athletic trainers use to base their decisions. And now we're leaning into another term called practice-based evidence. So this is what I've been using over the past two years, experimenting with what works best. So using innovative treatments and using our outcome measures to kind of analyze, you know, what works best in our patient care so I can base my decisions off those treatments. And this leads into the clinical application. So utilizing both of these, evidence-based practice and practice-based evidence, to assess and reflect on how you can improve. So using both of these in addition to the outcome measures, which allows us to reflect and improve. So how can the Mallard Prep Sports Medicine program improve as a whole? And I think outcome measures can really allow us to analyze that. 
So now we're going to go into data collections. This is the fun part. This is uh, over the past two years, I've had a bunch of experiences and a bunch of data collection that I'd like to share. So changes in pain. So I wanted to analyze my impact on an immediate change for our patient or the patients that come into my clinic. So what I was able to do was collect pre MPRS, which is the numerical pain rating scale from zero to ten. So pre to post in my first year, and then the first follow-ups, and the next day they come in and see me. And then I analyze the second year to see how I improve from that area. So I believe this is important because you know when a patient comes in, the primary complaint is mostly pain. So how can I impact their initial treatment and how they can leave with a meaningful change? So over the first year, it was 4.38 on average pre MPRS before I treated them, and then post 2.15. So mean change of 2.23, that's a decent value on the MPRS. So that's considered an MCID or a minimal clinically important difference. And then the first follow-up, they had a little bit less than when they came in the second time, or the first time they came back. And second year, kind of similar to my first year, but a little bit more of a change, 2.27 on average. And then what I think what's more important is the first follow-up. So the next day they come in, they actually have much less pain the first time through the next time they see me. I think that's pretty important. I think, you know, over time, you know, they come in, they want to, they want to change in pain is what they want. And I think, you know, sh showing this kind of shows my impact on how I can, how I can change that for them. So another important uh, part of my patient care is discharge. So how many treatments can I use to really get them back into play? And that's meaningful too, because these high school athletes or patients, they want to get back as soon as possible. So how, how quick can I get them to return to play? So discharge, my discharge criteria was basically, you know, no pain after full participation activity. So looking at each semester of my residency here, so semester one, I followed 11 patients through outcome measures to see you know, where they would be considered discharged. So it took me 3.36 treatments on average for those 11 patients to be discharged. Semester two kind of went up with nine patients. Semester, or semester three was eight with 2.88. But I think semester four kind of shows my progression, my improvement here. So I actually discharged more patients, 13 in less time. So on 2.61 treatments on average with these 13 patients, they were, they were considered discharge, no pain after full participation activity. So I think that's, that's really impactful as well. So next is uh, the primary reflex release technique for patellar tendon pain. So this is one of the studies I was involved in, um, one of the first studies I was involved in my first semester. So we used uh, an innovative technique to treat a common condition, so patellar tendon pain. Um, so obviously this is with, you know, jumpers, uh, runners, uh, they experience this a lot. So we had five patients, uh, and this is just a little bit of a um, little, some outcomes on the in immediate change in pain. So day one, NPRS, so the American Pain Rating Scale, and this is actually average. So this is we record, we recorded this in best, worst, and current over the past 24 hours. So what was the pain over the past 24 hours on average? So day one, they had 4.33 for patient one, 2.66. So, as you can see, throughout the five patients, each patient demonstrated a change the next day, the following day. Um, three of them can, uh, demonstrated an MCID, that minimal clinically important change with the asterisk here. So, uh, mean change, 2.32, it goes back to the MCID in the literature, the two points, it's greater than two points, so it was a significant change that I would uh, consider for this here. Then we're going into my second study I was involved in um, using PERC for shin splints, MTSS, or mediotibial stress syndrome. So I used a little bit of both. So I used evidence-based practice and practice-based evidence and put them together for this one. So I looked into the literature, you know, what, what was innovative in treating shin splints? And I found an article, Hansberger et al., 2015, she used five treatments or five uh, techniques of PERC to treat plantar fasciitis, and she had some, some nice success, so I wanted to see maybe if I can experiment with practice-based evidence on another condition, so I tried to treat MTSS. So first here is the initial treatment, so these are average, so these are when they come in, you know, after practice, they, they have pain, 
you know, what's their pain rating. So patient one, two, and three all demonstrated a significant change, two to three points on the MPRS, and the average shows that as well. So, um, so initially, PERT seemed to work, seemed to be successful. So we move forward to overall. So this was a four treatment design. Um, we want, I wanted to see how, you know, over time, you know, what was their outcome. So I added in some new outcomes here. So we have the DPAS, the Disability and Physically Active Scale. And then the PSFS, the Patient Specific Functional Scale. So the DPAS is an overall scale analyzing physical, um, emotional, like the whole well-being of the patient. PSFS, the patients give three activities, and we average them. And we look at over time. So patient one, over time, initial uh, three to final zero. 3.33 for patient two, final zero, and then patient three, five, 1.33 for final. And then over time, we see the averages. So all these asterisks, asterisks uh, show, show that there's a significant change for each outcome. So MCID is nine points for the DPAS, PSFS is two points, and as you can see for this chart or this table here that uh, you know, demonstrates you know, successful Successful, successful treatment. So, so another um, concept I looked into was the mulligan concept for lateral ankle sprains. So as we know, ankle sprains are a common condition in the physioactive population. We see these every day. Um, so I wanted to see if I could see if an innovative approach could help you know, treat this common condition. So, um, so we go and use the positional fault theories, which is basically a biomechanical change. So with an ankle sprain in the Mulligan concept, the distal fibula kind of rolls over the lateral malleolus, and that's what they say causes pain within the Mulligan concept. So what I wanted to see is, is this Mulligan concept lateral glide that could actually fix that biomechanical change and reduce pain. So um, this is uh, something I really want to look into going forward, because it obviously is a common condition. So outcomes are presented next here. So three patients here. Uh, this is recent, so this is my spring semester. So I had three patients. Um, and over the course of three days, all outcome measure, measures demonstrate improvement. So like we have here again, we have the MPRS, DPS, BSFS. But I also added in this cool outcome measure here, which is the FAM, which is this actually a specific ankle measure. So it has two subscales. It has the ADL, which is activities of daily living, and then it has the sports subscale. So the higher the percentage, the more function you have with your ankle sprain. So over time, as you can see, even patient one over one day had no painful function after the treatment. Um, patient two needed an extra day, but nonetheless, after three days, uh, two treatments, you know, full function, no pain. And patient three, similar similar outcome. So, seem to have some success. Uh, obviously, small sample size, but you know this is something we could look into moving forward, and uh, maybe it's something that a lot of other athletic trainers could possibly use down the road. So, with the Mulligan concept here in this uh, treatment, I use the, the technique as long well with, in the addition to the taping that's involved with the technique as well, and that seemed to hold in hold it in place. So, seem to be seem to be successful. So my future goals for residency. Um, so I want to develop an easier way to keep track of outcome measures. So obviously, like I said before, I believe outcome measures are extremely important. Um, like I said, not only to me, but to the program. So we have the Sportswear database. So what I would like to do is eventually develop or find a way to, uh, since they sign in, to have them fill out the survey or the outcome online. And that way we can keep track of everyone, all the different outcomes easier, because right now, I'm only using paper and pencil, so it um, gets a little hectic at times. Obviously, online would be a little easier for, for us. Um, I would like to continue research, data collection for various outcome conditions, so ankle sprains, tendinopathies, you name it, because this really interests me. Um, yeah, I'm going to be the best that I can at these conditions that these patients come in and you know are struggling with, and I want to really help them in that way. Um, third one. Inspire and teach young professionals. So I'm in a position now where I get to help, you know, athletic training students each semester. Um, 
and I would like to continue, you know, learning. I'm having trouble career. connecting to the internet. Check your Wi-Fi network. <laughs> and uh, I keep continuing to learn, you know, throughout my career as an athletic trainer, and um, and inspire and teach these young professionals to become the best athletic trainer that they can be. So, um, also for NATA and Athletic Trainers uh, Association. I'd like to present more down the line for. Uh, I'm having for the, trouble connecting to the. For the, <laughs> for the entire athletic training population to learn about what I'm doing and what others are doing to kind of change the athletic training profession. And I think in order to change the athletic training profession, we need to try new things and we need to collect these outcomes to kind of analyze where we're at and where we can improve them. So, special thank you. I um, just want to thank my family and friends, colleagues, and obviously professors, because without everyone in my life, I would not be here where I'm at now in my, in my career as an athletic trainer. Um, you know, everyone helped me in their own way, and uh, I appreciate, appreciate this help and just to thank you. So, any questions? Be anything you want. Why do you think you're able to discharge patients? earlier from in the fourth semester rather than the first semester? Um, I just think over time I really developed a confidence. So when I first started I didn't really, I didn't really fully understand the techniques at first and I really had to kind of learn my way through and I think with the confidence I developed and the understanding I developed over time with the outcomes, because the outcomes I can assess, you know, how can I improve in this situation. So. I think everything combined will help me improve in my fourth semester. Right. How yes. does how does this treatment fit in with all the other treatments that athletic trainers do, from rehab and tapings and exercise? How how does this fit in to that? So these are I feel like these <clears throat> seamless, seamlessly fit into all the traditional treatments that we do as athletic trainers. Um, yeah, we already have research out there on you know rehabs and you know modalities and you know it's just nice to you know see if these innovative treatments can really help um, in a more efficient, more effective manner. And I think you know using a combination of you know, what I've learned basic in my um, undergraduate courses and now my advanced knowledge put them together, I think makes me you know much better athletic trainer because I have all these different options. Is this ever a time where you're just using this as an isolated tool, or do you feel that really this fits in with doing a combination of things? Um, what I've been learning is actually, I think combination wise, has been actually working a little better for me lately. Um, but I do see that, you know, in isolation, some of these treatments, because I've been looking at my outcomes, and isolation wise, they work pretty well as well. So. Um, Specifically, the, the mulligan seems to really work to get that pain out of the way for the ankle sprains, but also, you know, you can, you know, do the rehabs and obviously all of that to get them, you know, especially if it's a worse, you know, much worse ankle sprain. So, so my follow-up question yes. would be then, when you did, when you measured your outcomes, mm -hmm. were there other treatments involved or were, were all these uh, patients just isolated techniques that you used? for the studies I did. Mm -hmm. So it was isolation wise. So for the ankle sprains, I just used the mulligan concept. So I just used the, the glide that is involved in the taping. Um, the specific ankle mulligan tape that we did. And then for the MTSS and the patellar tendon pain, we just isolated to specific CURT techniques, to see if they you know, noticed any changes with them. Mm -hmm. So we just use specific just to kind of see. So did they use medication at all? They did not. We controlled for all that. Okay. Yes. Any other questions? Mark, I need um, <laughs> So with like the BERT and the TMR stuff, is there a lot of research on it, or is it more up and coming, and do you use that a lot in research wise? Yes, there is not a lot of research out there on BERT or TMR, um, but there is a lot of groundbreaking stuff with TMR, especially for pictures. Um, with the Gamma et al. article, they used range of motion exercises to really improve uh, baseball pitchers' range of motion. Um, PERT, since it's not a lot of research, that's why I'm really interested in it. I want to, you know, experiment with it and see, you know, what comes out, and then I can share that with others. That's basically why I'm really involved with that one a lot. So, 
Did your yeah. subjects seem to be very receptive towards your types of techniques? Yes. Um, most of them are. Some um, don't really see changes, but then, you know, if they don't see changes, I can go back and reflect. And I think reflecting is one of the bigger parts that allows me to really improve on what can help them learn. I think that's a really good question because yes. thinking with that, what you just asked is you, you mentioned about educating other athletic trainers. Mm -hmm. But where does it fit in these techniques for the athletes themselves? Is there self stuff that they self techniques that they that you educate them with, or as the question was asked, you know, were they more receptive and how how does that fit into their mindset about this? Yes, yeah, I'm, I'm glad you asked that because a lot of these treatments, it's nice that they have their own home exercise program they can go with. So specifically Mulligan concept, there's a lot that I can do, but also I can show them how to facilitate that improvement at home too. So um, let's go, for example, let's say someone has back pain and they have back pain, you know, in the midline of the back and I provide a mulligan movement, they can, I can show them a trick to do them at home. So with them at home, they can provide a fist into that spot and they can provide their own movement at home and mm -hmm. they can provide Decrease the pain at home for them, and I think they really like that as well. So. Did you follow any of those? Like, were any of those patients that, in your outcomes, did they do self treatments outside of what so you did? These, uh, the little studies that I did, they did not. Okay. Um, but with other patients that I worked with here, I would keep track of you know, what they did at home. I would tell them, you know, to do like three sets of ten at home. They would come in the next day, tell me how they did, mm -hmm. and stuff. So. Okay. TMR is good because they, I can give them a sheet and they can actually record it themselves. Thanks, guys. And thank you.